Now, if you've been joining us uh, in recent weeks, you know that we've been uh, looking at a passage from Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 13 specifically. And uh, Kath Durning is now going to read that passage for us. Thank you, Kath. And yet I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in human or angelic tongues, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will, still be, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Thank you very much, Kath. On the 20th of July, 1969, a man in an oversized white suit, a funny hat and big boots, took a step off a stepladder, and in so doing became the first person from Earth to set foot on another planet. His name was Neil Armstrong. And as he did so, he uttered these words. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And that was the phrase, the summary, that he used to summarize over 10 years of work by a team of advanced scientists at NASA, $25.5 billion in the 1970s value of the dollar was expended, and lives were lost, and a lot of lessons learned along the way. But the culmination of that space program to put man on the Earth was summarized by Armstrong with those words. That's one small step for man one giant leap for mankind. And you know, summaries of what's gone on are abound, don't they? Sometimes you're talking to someone, they say, don't tell me the whole story, just summarize it. Give me the salient points. We want the sort of instant summary. My career has been in the law and I've spent a lot of time in court. And I found that judges are very good at summarizing. You can have a long court case with a lot of evidence and they have to summarize it at the end. And one of my favorites was a case we were involved in and after many hours of argument and evidence and cross-examination, the judge sat there and he said this, there are many reputable car dealers in London, but your client is not one of them. That's how he summarized the case. Now, the Apostle Paul summarized in the passage we've just read a lot of teaching that uh, he'd laid out in the previous 11 or 12 chapters of the book of Corinthians. And he summarized his teaching thus. He used this phrase. He said, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And then he summarized the summary when he said, and the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love. You may remember some years ago, Paul McCartney and John Lennon wrote a song called All You Need Is Love, and it made them a lot of money. Maybe they were inspired by Paul's writing here. 
but they were writing about romantic love. And Paul doesn't write about that here. Paul's writing about the love that should be the attitude of followers of Jesus as they relate to other people, as they relate to their neighbor, as they relate to each other. And Jesus himself, when he was on earth, he summarized the greatest commandment. Someone said to him, what is the greatest commandment that you have for us? And he said, oh, it's this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And at that point, he told the story of the Good Samaritan, where someone reached across the social divide to help someone when the normal thing was to walk by on the other side of the road. Jesus said that true love is for God and for other people. Jesus was keen to advocate the importance of the kind of love that Paul is writing about here in Corinthians. Let's just put the passage in a little bit of context, a little bit of background. Um, the church in Corinth, in, the, in Greece, uh, was in a secular and a very sensual city. It was a city where pleasure, sport, commercial activity, and personal affluence were the, the aspirations of its citizens. I guess in modern day parlance, you would say they worked hard and they played hard. And Paul had established a church there on a previous visit to, to Corinth. And the church had a very cosmopolitan congregation. Because it was a trading city, people came from various parts of, of the then world to, to do their business there and would have joined the church and bought the flavors of where they came from with them. And Paul writes this letter to the church in Corinth to deal with some of the issues that had arisen in the church. There were divisions in the church. People were falling out with each other. There, were, there was immorality in the church. Church members were going to law. They were filing lawsuits against each other. There were problems in marriages. There were problems in communion and problems in worship that Paul set out to speak about. And they were abusing the spiritual gifts. The gifts God had given them to serve him in the church and beyond, they were abusing them. So Paul writes a letter. Now it's important to remember that when letters were written in those days, they didn't uh, sit behind a computer or an iPad. They didn't do it longhand either. Paul would have had a secretary and probably he would have been pacing up and down the floor as he's dictating it and the poor scribe is trying to get it down as best he can. But Paul wrote the letter and he finished up his advice at the end of the previous chapter, chapter 12, by saying, and I will show you a better way to live, a better way to react to each other, a better way to live in harmony with each other in the church and with the community beyond. And chapter 13 that Kath just read to us is it. That's the better way. Paul saying, the greatest way you can live life, relate to other people, is to love other people. So let's drill down a little bit more detail as to what he's saying. I think Paul's making the point here that love is essential. You remember what he said? He said you can speak with eloquence. You can even use the voices of angels if you want to. But if you don't have love, then you're just a noise. It's not going to count for anything. He said, you can speak God's word with power. You can reveal heavenly mysteries. You can have amazing faith that it will overcome obstacles and challenges. But without love, said Paul, you're nothing. It's not going to work. He went on to say, you can, either, you can even give everything you owe to the poor. You can even lay down your life and be... Uh, you, you can even lay down your life. But if you have love, it's not going to count for anything. Now that's quite shocking when you think about it, isn't it? That must have shocked the listeners or the readers there in Corinth, and it should shock us today to think about that. 
You see, whereas we may look at someone and say, that person is so gifted, they have tremendous gifts and they exercise those gifts, God looks at the heart. He doesn't look at the gifts because he's given the person those gifts anyway. And if they exercise those gifts and are so-called successful, well, he knows about it because he gave them the gifts. What God looks for is the attitude of the heart, the attitude of love, whether there, where there is love during the exercise of those gifts. That's what counts with him. Is there love in what we do for God? The city of Brussels in Belgium has been described as being at the crossroads of society. And one of the reasons it has that description is that people are trafficked into Brussels from various parts of the world and are sold or sent into various forms of slavery in Europe and beyond. And it becomes a sort of transit place for that. And one of our friends here at TBC that we work closely with and we love very much is Phil Lane. And Phil has based he and his family there to do something about it, to take the love of Christ into that situation. Now, Phil can't be here personally because of COVID restrictions, but thanks to the wonders of Zoom, he can grin at us uh, via Zoom. And it's good to see you, Phil. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Now, I understand it's Father's Day over there, so you've been spoilt rotten, no doubt. Our cards have been made and presents have been given and breakfast has been lavished upon me, so I'm very blessed. Well done. It's, my, it's our turn next week over here. Phil, you've been in Belgium for some years, and, and is it true to say that, that something stirred in your heart when you saw the need of people in that city? Uh, cer certainly, and... It's an essential part of my faith that God, God you know, love God and, and love your neighbour is, is the heart of it, isn't it? And so when you see a need, God stirs up uh, a, a desperate desire to do something about it, to, 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 to act for justice, to, to, to act in kindness and compassion and to, and to see a difference in, in individuals' lives and, and society as a whole. So, um, yeah, this all completely resonates uh, with me. And, and I, you know, very often people say, Why, what, what, how do you keep going? It's such a huge problem with human trafficking and violence against women. And all the things that you see, how do you keep going? And the answer is love. We... we you can't walk past when you love somebody. Um, and, and so that is, the, that is the engine, that is the fuel, that is what keeps us going. Okay. Can you give us an example of how this love you've seen in practice there in, in your work? Uh, well, just to give an example from uh, the last couple of weeks, um, we've been... Uh, so one of the projects that we run here for Oasis is uh, to help women who have been uh, suffered violence in the home um, and then very often they become vulnerable to being uh, trafficked into exploitation. And we recently got a call from uh, a young uh, Pakistani woman uh, married to a, a British man, an Asian British man, and he was very violent towards her and she needed immediate help. Um, we helped her with legal advice and she got a court injunction to keep him away from her and then she was due to become homeless because he, he had the flat so we've had to help her to get um, into social housing and into a safe house and all these very serious um, yes, legal things uh, and, and we're, we're motivated by love to stand beside her not looking for anything in return um, because we see the image of God in her, in her and in her children. She's got a very small baby. But the, the, the beautiful thing about uh, what, what, what's happened uh, recently is um, she, she's actually living very close to, to, to where Rachel and I and the kids live. Um, and so I asked our local church to get involved. And there was this outpouring of love. She's, she's a, a young Muslim woman. Uh, it, began during uh, Ramadan um, and so the church decided that they would provide the, the iftar, uh, you know, the breaking of fast in the evening 
And so we kind of took our meal train that usually supports people who've maybe been sick or whatever, and people just flooded to help her with food until she had to say, we've got enough. <laughs> Thank you very much. And people were looking after her children and people helped her to, to, to move into the new accommodation. And it was as if God's love was bubbling up in them and it enabled them to cross a line, to, to step out into something which potentially is scary or, or very different. What do I cook for a young Muslim family? Is it safe to go and visit? What, what can I do? What shouldn't I do? And that courage came from, I really believe, from the love that God places in the hearts of those who follow him. Phil, thank you. It's lovely to see you. Thanks for your contribution. Keep going, keep on with your good work. It's really making a difference. You're an encouragement to us and it's great to partner with you. Greetings to the family and love from all of us here at Tunbridge. Thank you. So love is essential in what we do. We need to exercise love, as, as Phil said, it motivates us. The other thing about love that this passage tells us is that actually, let's be honest, it doesn't come naturally. It's, we have to make an effort. We're not, the moment we become a Christian or a follower of Jesus, we don't suddenly love everybody. It has to be a conscious development in our, in our, in our character. Paul here sets out in, in the passage we read together some of the characteristics of this love. Let me read them to you. He said, love is patient. It's kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs. It doesn't delight in evil. It rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. That's quite a comprehensive list, isn't it, of the characteristics of this love. You know, imagine going out tomorrow into your community, whatever your community is. It may be in education, it may be in an office, it may be in your community, it may be in your social circle, maybe in your Zoom calls, or even in your coffee shop. Imagine going out into this week, resolve that you would try and live out some of those characteristics in your behavior, in your attitude during this week. Imagine the difference it would make, not only to you, but to the environment you're in. If you were able to exercise patience, kindness, you didn't envy, you didn't boast, you're not proud, you're not rude, you're not self-seeking, not easily angered. You don't keep a record of wrongs, you don't delight in evil, but you do rejoice in the truth. You protect, you trust, you hope, you persevere. As I say, it doesn't come easily, it doesn't come naturally. I learned this lesson the hard way a few years ago. I had to make a, a, a quick business trip to the Middle East, to the country of Jordan. And it was one of those where you fly in on a Friday, have some meetings Saturday and Sunday, and then back again on the Monday. And I arrived late afternoon at Heathrow Airport and walked into the terminal, and the sight that I saw is the most depressing for a traveler, because there was a huge queue from the check-in desk snaking through the terminal which told me there was something wrong. I joined the queue and the message was passed down the line. The airline are on strike, a one day strike. The airline concern was the European one. I was flying to somewhere else in Europe, changing and then going into Amman. As I joined the queue and we began to inch up to the check-in desk for our turn, I kind of rehearsed in my mind what I would say. I thought, well, firstly, I'll talk about the carriage of people by air act, and I'll remind the lady of their responsibilities. We'll then deal with contract law. I bought a ticket, paid the price for a ticket to fly to Amman, Jordan. They have a contractual duty to deliver. We'll hit her with that as well. And generally, just remind her of her responsibilities, because it's not good enough. And I was working up ahead of steam, thinking all the meetings I was going to miss and the rearrangement that would have to take place. As I got nearer to the queue, the check-in, 
I could hear what the lady was saying to everybody. And it could be summarized thus. I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do. Here's a form, fill it up, put it in, and you'll get a refund on your ticket. That was it. Nothing more. Simply that. And I was next in the queue, and I was about to begin my spiel as I walked up to the desk when, and I believe this was the Holy Spirit, prompted me and said, the lady behind the check-in is having a bad day. It's not her doing. It's not her fault. She's not on strike. Don't take it out on her. How about being kind to her? My immediate reaction was, what? Kind? When they've messed me about like this, when they're going to cause all this interruption and these meetings that I need to attend, I won't be able to. But I went with the nudge. And as I arrived at the desk, I said to the lady, I'm really sorry that you've had a you're having a bad day. It's not your fault having to sort everyone's problems out. I'm afraid I'm probably going to add to them because, you know, I have a ticket for this flight. And she looked up and she gave me half a smile and said, where are you going to? I said, well, I'm probably going home, but I was hoping to go to Oman, Jordan. And she tapped away at her screen and she said, I can put you on a flight first thing tomorrow morning. You'll be there at lunchtime. Would that do? And I said, well, actually, it would do very nicely. Thank you, because I'd be there in time for my first meeting. So I said, what time do I get to the airport tomorrow morning? And she said, actually, um, hang on a moment. She tapped away and she said, we're going to put you in a hotel tonight here at the airport so you won't have to get up very early. And here's a voucher for your meals. And here's a voucher for a taxi to take you to and from the hotel. And I thanked her profusely and picked up the vouchers and walked away and thought, what a difference my attitude had made to me as well as to her. Love is patient and kind. It doesn't always seek to assert its rights. That doesn't mean we're, we're a pushover, that we'll go with anything that's going. There are times when we have to make uh, our case and, um, and stand firm. But it's an attitude. This attitude of love and respect for other people is what Paul is talking about. And you say, well, it's very difficult, if not impossible. And actually, it is very difficult, but it is possible. Because we have the Holy Spirit who can come and to help us. And so perhaps consciously each day before we start the working day, we say to God and the Holy Spirit, please help me today. I don't know what the challenges are going to be, but I pray that you would help me to be like you want me to be, to, to be able to demonstrate some of these characteristics of love and patience and kindness to other people so that I can be an attractive witness for you. So love is a bit of an effort, doesn't come naturally. But Paul reminds us that love is permanent. He says love never fails or never gives up. You see, love is the only one of those three characteristics on your screen that will survive forever. When we get to heaven, if we know Jesus as our saviour and we've trusted him and he's forgiven our sins and we've received eternal life, when it's our time to go to heaven or if Jesus comes first uh, beforehand, we won't need faith anymore. Faith will be complete. We won't need hope anymore because our hope will have been manifest. But we will need love. Because love is the attitude of heaven. Love is the flavor, the atmosphere of heaven. Love for each other, love for God. So love will survive. That's why Paul says love is permanent. It will continue forever. Now, I started off this talk by saying that summaries, we like them in life, we like to know the short, pithy version of what's said. And if you say to me, well, what's your summary of what you've been speaking about this morning? I would say this. Let me take you back to that piece of video we ran earlier on with that engine. Did you notice what the problem with the engine was? Was it a lack of oil or was it a lack of fuel? Well, I'll tell you the answer. It was a lack of oil. That engine got noisier and noisier as the pistons clanked against the camshaft and as it began to seize up because there was no oil. And eventually the engine seized and that's when the engine stopped. 
love for the follower of Jesus, love for other people, is the lubricant, the oil, that if present in our lives, actually makes all the difference to how we relate to other people. You see, oil in an engine has three main functions. The first one is that it cools the engine. The engine in your car gets extremely hot as you drive along, but the oil dissipates that heat by pushing it out and spreading it away and throughout the engine. So the point of friction where the pistons go up and down, that heat is transferred to other parts of the engine. And if we have this love that Paul is talking about as an attitude in our lives, we will be in situations that we will remove the heat from a potentially combustible situation, perhaps a relationship. We'll be able to bring coolness into that situation. The second thing that oil and engine does, it lubricates the engine, it makes the parts go smoothly and it enables them to operate quietly as well. The nice purring sound of an engine means the engine is well lubricated. And the third thing oil does in an engine, it cleans it. It removes the debris. So when you have your oil changed in the car and they take out the little sump screw, out comes a lot of gunky oil and usually little bits of the engine and other dirt and mass that it's cleaned the engine comes out as well. And if we have this kind of love Paul's talking about, as we go about our lives, in the situations we're in, we're going to be in this week, all of us, we will bring cleansing to a situation. We'll improve the atmosphere. It will be better for our presence and our demonstration of those characteristics. So love can make the difference. But probably that's why Jesus said, just before his death to his followers, he said this, all men will know that you're followers of mine if you have love one for another. If we love other people, Christians around us and people uh, in society generally, if we're so committed to love others, then people will take note of us and they'll take note of the God that we love and we serve, just as Phil was making reference to in his interview. And so this week, we have the opportunity, perhaps it's a challenge for us, in every situation we'll be in, will we try and make a difference by having this attitude of love? Or will we go about life as we normally do and forget about that? Because if we have the attitude of love, as Paul's talking about here, we're going to see difference. We're going to see change. We will be the difference in our conversations, in our attitudes, in our dealings, in our intentions. Let's just pray together. Father God, these things are difficult, but we thank you that you give us your Holy Spirit and I pray that your Holy Spirit would enable us, each one of us, this week, to live differently as we put into practice these principles. Thank you for your word. Thank you. It has so much to say to us about everyday living. And this passage is key as we approach this week. Please help us. Please strengthen us. Please enable us to make a difference for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.